Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan, for doing this. I appreciate it. I'm happy to be here. So where do we start? I think you should start uh, uh, by reading from uh, Bewilderness, if you're ready. Okay, I'm going to read. I am ready. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got a mark. I've got it marked. I'm going to read a quick three and a half pages. It takes five minutes tops, and then we will get down to chatting. Um, so these are the, this is just the opening moments from Bewilderness. As soon as Luce's going away party wound down enough for me to slip off unnoticed, I went outside and sat on the little wooden bench across from the restaurant. I guess I'd always known she was going to leave. Even before that first instant release summer, when she was nothing more to me than a fellow cocktail server, alone and drifting, you could tell she was the kind of person who needed to scrape more out of life than most. But Luce was also someone who liked to drag stuff out as long as possible, so of course she wanted to give one final hug to every last coworker, from the waiters who always skipped out on their closing duties to the hosts who made sure to give you all the worst customers until you snuck them a coffee mug of wine. I, I figured I had time for a cigarette before she came out and caught me. I hadn't smoked in months, but the last couple days had been more stressful than usual, and in a moment of panic I'd bought a pack off one of the dishwashers. It wasn't my brand, but that didn't matter. Times like this were when all the old urges came swooping back in. I dug around in my bag for my lighter and though it took a few tries, I got the flame going. Once that first hit of nicotine roared into my bloodstream, it felt like some broken off part of me finally righted itself and slid into place. By the time Luce came outside, all bundled up in her giant green parka, I burned through three marbreds and part of a fourth and my head was swimming way up above me. She called to me from the door. He's still not answering. You didn't hear from him, did you? I dropped my cigarette in the snow before she could see it. Wilkie? She ran her eyes over me. Who else? Said he'd pick us up at 11 by the, um, said he'd pick us up by 11 at the latest. I hoisted my purse over my shoulder and trudged back toward her. He's just caught up in his own going away deal. Bet he's standing on a chair and making a big speech or something. You know how he is. That earned me a faint smile, but you could tell by the stiffness in Luce's jaw that she didn't believe it. She got out her phone and called him again. When Wilkie still didn't answer, her cheeks went splotchy with anger. Dude, it better have a good explanation. It's okay, I don't mind walking, I said. Luz and I rented a tiny clabbered bungalow a little less than a mile from the restaurant. Neither of us had a car. Or actually, Luce did, an old Chevy Impala that needed at least a thousand bucks in repairs before she could drive it, and which was busy decomposing in the side lot next to the skeletal remains of a tractor the previous tenants had wisely abandoned. When the weather was halfway decent, we rode bikes to work. But it had been snowing on and off since morning, so even if we'd been able to make it uphill to Broad Street during daylight, backing back down, biking back down on slick roads wasn't our idea of a choice evening. Not after the night last winter when Luce hit a patch of ice, tumbled over her handlebars and fractured her elbow. She lost almost a month of shifts and even then she had to learn how to carry trays left-handed. At least she had Wilkie. They'd been together over two years and lately he'd been working nights at a nearby bar, the kind with painted over windows and the stink of urinal cakes wafting out of the bathroom. Although me and Luce always started our shifts a couple hours before him, if it was raining or snowing or we just didn't feel like biking, all we had to do was shoot him a quick text and he'd come give us a lift. Wilkie was a sweet, low-key guy who had gotten himself bounced out of the army for an incident that wasn't his fault, not really. Which is to say that in some ways he was incredibly dumb. And don't get me wrong, Wilkie had a head packed full of brains and a college education to go along with it. And that's more than you can say for anyone else in our circle, myself included. But at the same time, he was someone who always went around trusting everybody on the planet, no matter how little they might have deserved it. And I'll stop there. Thanks for listening. Well, it's a terrific beginning to uh, to this extraordinary book. And uh, I think you know, it's, it's worth saying, uh, one of the reasons I'm so excited to do this with you uh, is that you and I have been friends for quite some time. And uh, one of the things this book is about it's a, uh, is uh, these two people who are working uh, for servers and just working in the salt mines of the service industry and all the crap they deal with. 
It is also about uh, these two young women, their friendship, and about addiction, of course. Um, but it was, it's, it's, it's especially satisfying sitting here talking to you because we were both uh, in, you know, waiting tables and talking about our writing and hoping that one day we would be able to get out of there. And, um, and uh, that's happened. And here you are with your debut novel and it's so exciting. We, yeah, so everyone, Nathan and I met in Asheville waiting tables at Biltmore Estate. <laughs> and we would talk and laugh. And Nathan always had this notebook full of writing and he would write. And I'd be like, oh, I wish I could actually write while I'm working. I'm too busy being traumatized, I think. Um, which is why Nathan got out um, years before I ever did. But I have clawed my way out. I might well find myself back there one day. But um, too. for now, I am, I am out of the salt mines for now. <laughs> So let's talk about bewilderness. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's been out since what, June 1st, right? Yeah. Um, and it is, uh, it is you know, I've, I was never, I never read your writing uh, while we were friends uh, in the restaurant, even though I tried Sarah Christie to ask every once in a while. I just didn't, you know, it, it didn't work out that way. <laughs> so I always had full faith that it was good. It's because I, I, guess I, I know you, I know how you engage with the world, but uh, to actually read it and to be so much better than just good, to be, have to be this, you know, this, to read this really powerful, emotionally engaging and, uh, and occasionally brutal and occasionally very tender book uh, is, uh, was such a treat. Um, one of the things that I think is uh, particularly interesting about it uh, is the way you write about this friendship, this friendship between these two young women and, uh, and how that friendship is part of the ground, is kind of like, well, is the ground that they navigate while they are dealing with uh, their addictions. And so I wanted to ask if you would talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'm struck by the way they, these two, these two, uh, these two people genuinely love each other and are genuinely eager to help each other. And even though sometimes that help manifests in ways that are not so good for them, um, but it always comes from a genuine place. It's not a cynical friendship. Uh, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about about writing that, about conceiving that friendship, and and, uh, and why basically you wanted to, you chose that as the vector for dealing for addressing a book about addiction yeah um i've been thinking about and i want to ask you this nathan at some point but i've been thinking a lot about um you know how we we're so often told write what you know mm -hmm. and I, i've also heard write you know write, write what you know is one thing but also write what you want to know and, and so I, I like that to me is more stimulating, right? What you want to know, what, what do you want to find out? Um, so I approached this and all I knew was that I wanted to <laughs> write a novel <laughs> um, and get out of the salt mine. So, okay, what do I want to know? What, how can I imagine this? What, how can I seduce myself into opening a document day after day for what I knew would be years? Mm. Um, and I didn't realize this until very recently, probably within the last two or three weeks when I um, did an interview with a friend um, who asked me a similar question. And I thought, you know, I was so incredibly lonely at the time mm -hmm. when I was writing this novel, I was in school at Florida. I went, I went, I went back to school um, and I was older than almost all of my colleagues and Although I had friends, it was never enough for my greedy little heart. So I think I created this friendship because I so desperately needed it in my life. Um, and that by making, you know, the first person narrator long for this woman who has, you know, her best friend has a smart mouth and she's sassy and she never quite gives the narrator enough love <laughs> that I could understand deeply. So that is the right what you know, but also write what you want to know. I wanted to know that sort of friendship where they are, you know, there for each other, no matter what. And even if, yes, they sabotage each other at times and stick knives in each other's backs, 
it's out of love because they want to keep each other in their life. You know, if you, if you're going to leave me, then I'll rope you back in. <laughs> um, so I think that was it. What do you want to know? And it's so funny how art can teach you about yourself after you've created and, and not a moment before. Um, yeah, I needed yeah. it. And, it. and it came to be that way. That's a good way. Of, yeah, that's a, that's a good way of putting it. And it, it's, I think it, I think it, it seems to me uh, that it all, that it feeds directly into the problem they have with addiction because they're, you know, they're trying to fill, and, and this is maybe too abstract a way to put it, but you know, this kind of unfillable hole inside, right? It seems like they're as much motivated by loneliness as they are by uh, anything else. And I was, it's, it's interesting to hear, to hear you talk about, you know, not, you know, not having, an, not getting enough love as she, as she needed, the, the protagonist, Irene. And um, because that was something I definitely noticed in the story and something that I appreciated because I don't see this uh, written about uh, much, or maybe I just haven't encountered it, but the, the, sen- the imbalance uh, of affection uh, in, in any kind of relationship, uh, it, 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 it's often there. And uh, there are many times where Irene is just aching for more from Luce, her friend. Uh, but Luce is also aching for this. And, but she's found someone, uh, she's found Wilkie, who you, we meet in, your, uh, in the passage you read. Um, and, and there seems to be like a shift happening uh, for Luce. And that's leaving Irene out in the cold. And just to see that ache kind of manifested and the things that it causes her to feel and to do, uh, I thought was really, really very moving. Thank you. The, um, so the, which, which, which leads me to questioning, uh, wanting to ask about, um, How to how we decide to get into the minds of the of these characters, or, why, or, or basically how to empathetically portray characters who are doing things that are that would that would uh, be very uh, it would inspire the lack of empathy from people without having been spending times in their heads. Uh, this is something that you know is near and dear to my heart, and uh, and uh, and I was I'm curious as to why. How you chose to approach that? How you chose to approach that difficulty of writing these characters? I mean, I think once we writers let go of the idea that our characters have to be likable, mm-hmm. and that gives us a lot of freedom and a lot of liberty. Um, one thing that I've certainly heard from writers far more talented than myself and that I try to remind myself of is um, we learn who people are by the choices they make. And usually if someone makes the choice that all of us would make, like if you choose to, you know, cheer your kid on when they win at T-ball, then, okay, we learned that you're a a healthy parent, but we don't really learn that much. But if you choose instead to lose your mind and throw a temper tantrum when (laughs) your kid's T-ball coach makes a call that you don't like, well, if you make a bad choice, we learn quite a bit more about who you are. So I think there's so much opportunity for our writers and we can have our characters make bad choices in moments of tension, like what, who are you in the foxhole? Um, mm. Then that reveals who these people are. I think it just gives us so, so many more opportunities than, you know, I think as writers, we tend to be good observers and we want to watch and see what's going on. But I think that can be, a bit treacherous for for characters instead if our characters can you know be the guy who loses their mind at the t-ball game or who lies to their friend in order to keep their friend in their life or who you know steals something because of something or in this case you know i mean we all i think most of us bring some sort of bias um some sort of you know to opioid addiction is highly you know there's a lot of stigma surrounding it mm-hmm. Um, how do you make that likable? I think one way to think of it is, and how I came to think of it, I brought my own stigma to this when I entered the, this narrative. Um, people take painkillers because they're in pain. 
who among us does not want to get out of pain somehow? I mean, if we can think about the pain that we're all in, I mean, look at this planet is on fire. (laughs) We live in a nation founded on white supremacy. Um, You know, people are dying (laughs) of COVID. People are dying of all sorts of things. There's incredible poverty in our country. I mean, there is pain everywhere. It's, It's really surprising that more people don't use. And then when you throw capitalism into it and how so many like corporations profit from this, I mean, I think people are doing pretty darn good as it is. Um, and we can, we need to do a lot better. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Are you, do you find yourself drawn to characters uh, like this? Characters that are sort of a peripheral uh, or uh, uh, you know, kind of outside the uh, sort of the nimbus of social acceptance? I love characters like that. I love to read about them. Um, I try to write from that point of view. I grew up in, um, I grew up, I was born and raised in Greensboro um, in a low income family and waited tables for years. I mean, this wasn't, you know, my waiting table experience wasn't like the tourist experience of waiting tables while I was in college on weekends. And then I got out and got my job. No, I dropped out of college to wait tables and continued to wait tables for so long that I'm not even gonna tell you people how long it was, but let's just say in my acknowledgements, I say it was over 20 years. And that's a lie because it was more than that. (laughs) Um, That's how long I did it. And so I, yes, um, on the periphery, to me, that is the center. Um, And and the center, as I see it, you know, who occupies the center? The people with power. So let's get some power to us on the periphery. (laughs) Let's give us the spotlight. Let's give us the mic for once. Um, These are the stories I want to read. These are the stories I try to write. And I think in our culture, yes, we need to spread the power around equitably and diversely (laughs) far more than we do. Yeah. Do you think that being being a server for uh, a long time helped kind of steer you in that direction? Do you you feel like it uh, kind of exposed you to to a, a slice of life that you might not otherwise have seen or, and if so, how? I do think that anybody who's paying attention would probably experience the same like slice of life or whatever. I do think we all have opportunities, whether we're just like paying attention and when we're in, you know, airports or the pharmacy waiting to pick something up or, you know, in line at the grocery store, we, we have this opportunity. I think um, what complicates it for food servers is the dynamic of money and how, you know, you you, your income depends on how well you can charm someone into liking you, into yeah. paying you. Um, you know, in North Carolina, we make sub-minimum wage. You know, I was making, what, $3 an hour <laughs> plus tips in 2015, $3 an hour plus tips. And it ended up, you know, okay, most nights, because, you know, you do it long enough, you learn how to you learn how to do it and, but some nights it doesn't, I don't know. It's, you know, the history of tipping is, is, uh, is racist, is sexist, is ableist. We need to get rid of it. And that's a whole other tangent. But yeah, I do think throwing capitalism into it and, and learning like you cannot pay your bills unless you engage with these people in a very, you know, particular type of way that makes them engage with you and like you. And, and you, sometimes it's, you know, you trade something of yourself in order to, to go home with grocery money. Yeah. And that might be the difference between just like observing someone at the airport and like, check that dude out. You know, you, you, your, your, uh, your income doesn't rely on, on your observational skills and how you can navigate those waters. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think, you know, it, it, it kind of puts you into a forced, position of subservience, uh, not only to the customer, but to the employer, the employer who's paying you $3 an hour, uh, but still has full control over, over whether or not you have that job and the, all the extra duties are kind of assigned to you. And, uh, that, that, that are sometimes, uh, a little onerous. <laughs> that don't fall under the purview of waiting tables. I had, when I first moved back to North Carolina, um, my first job, it was a $2 an hour job and we were doing all the cook side work 
because they, they were making what eight or nine dollars an hour <laughs> so it was cheaper to pay the servers to like make all the sauces and do the weird stuff for two dollars an hour two hours before our shift started like what how is this legal and it's legal mm -hmm. yeah i think you put that in the book didn't you the uh, they had to do the cook side work probably <laughs> there was you know, you can write a lot of things if you're angry enough. So people, if, you, if anyone out there watching this wants to write a book, get mad, get revenge, put it in your book. Um, you will not likely make very much money from it um, unless you're really lucky, but it does feel quite delightful. It does. <laughs> it, well, it, it, and it, things like that helped provide the book with so much verisimilitude. I mean, there's so, there's, there's, that, those small details uh, that just kind of like decorate the background of the narrative uh, immerse you in, in the story all the further. You, you fully trust the writer's voice because she seems to know exactly what she's talking about. And that uh, seems to indicate, or you know, well, that I think is replicated with the uh, what must have been an enormous amount of research that you've done because that the same is true um, uh, with the drug culture. And uh, there, was, there was even a, uh, there's a chapter in there in which um, the uh, narrator, uh, Irene, addresses the reader um, and in which, and she, the, this is what I wanted to ask you about this chapter because it, she is telling, she is kind of like uh, giving the reader uh, some advice, which starts out being, don't do this, but then gets a little bit into, but if you do, do this and do this and do this, and you can do this trick. And uh, I was, I found it to be very powerful uh, because it seems, uh, it seems like a dangerous thing to write. Not in that, not in the way, not that it's an irresponsible thing to write. I don't mean dangerous in that way, but I mean dangerous in the way that it's uh, it's a little bit shocking to to read. And I have to imagine uh, that people who are reading this who have lived that life or are living that life are going to read that and feel a kind of a visceral connection and respect. I think that's, to, to me, I would think that that chapter is where if they haven't already, they are gonna be like, okay, She's not bullshitting. Uh, this is this is the real stuff, and I think that is that's powerful and that's valuable. And I think, uh, and I wonder actually. I, I, my question is, I'm wondering, was that something that you were nervous about doing? Did you have uh, did you hesitate at all, or were you just kind of like steamrolling along at that point, and what came out came out? That, you know, many of those chapters were quite worked over and struggled through and cursed over and tried, tried to get my partner, uh, Jared, who is a far better writer than I am to write, please write this one for me. And he would never do it because he's so mean. <laughs> that weird chapter that you're talking about came out pretty quickly um, in a coffee shop in Tallahassee, Florida, um, within a few hours. I don't know how I, I mean certainly you know we do prep work in restaurants that's one skill that I you bring to your writing you kind of do prep work for your fiction so I, I had done some research as you mentioned but it came out quickly um, basically I wanted to do a do's and don'ts chapter do this don't do this um, and at no point did I feel an obligation to don't do drugs, this is your brain on drugs, you know, the stuff that we grew up with. But I did feel, um, as anyone I think in this community feels, is we want people to stay alive. No one's gonna say, don't don't get out of the pain that you need to escape from. Right. But, um, you know, harm reduction. Okay, well, if, you're, if you need to get out of the pain that you're experiencing, get out of the pain that you're experiencing, but for fuck's sake, use a clean needle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, don't, don't use, you know, something that's, you know, if you don't use random pills that don't come straight from a prescription bottle, or if you do test it or you know, what, a, you know, it wasn't trying to, I don't know, be some commercial by any means, but I do, but I do know that, I, you know, I dedicated the book to those of us who are no longer with us. Um, and someone I worked with died of an OD the week that I finished this 
draft, the, the, the very first draft. Um, but I also wrote it for those of us who are trying to stay. So, you know, I don't know. It was a do's and don'ts, be safe. <laughs> I tried to keep it as honest as I could and it came out quickly and I let it, I let it ride. And yeah, that was, that's the yeah. origin story of that chapter. I think it's all the better for it. I think when you talk about not wanting to make it a commercial, I think this is uh, why this book succeeds uh, where others I have read that deal with this kind of thing fall down because I, I feel that there is a need that some people, that a lot of folks have, a lot of writers have to be, uh, a little didactic and, and, and to like to be a little condescending, frankly. And this book is not at all condescending. Uh, it, it never disrespects, it never assumes a reader won't get it, and it never disrespects its own characters. Uh, it, it's, the heart is always fully on their side. And, uh, and I, think, I think that makes all the difference in a book like this. And I think it makes it believable in a way that it would not be if it was just a kind of a, a shaking finger. Um, so uh, yeah, I, Thank you. that's not a question. That's just a, <laughs> I'll take it. I need it. Thank you. I love it all over me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was in interested too in, um, there are a couple scenes in here, which I've, which I guess I'm, I'm not going to ask you a direct question, but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of I present this and, 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 and hopefully you can expound upon it a little bit. But uh, there are a couple of scenes in which I was, I admired the restraint uh, in which uh, I think one's instincts as a writer might not normally to be to show restraint. Uh, and I won't get into what the scenes are because the readers experience them. Uh, but there's a scene involving uh, the two friends being roofied in which uh, something quite dreadful uh, is alluded to have happened. Uh, but you don't, not, even, not only do you not go into detail, but you don't even spend a lot of uh, verbiage on the after effects. It's like a note that you hit, and instead of hitting it again, you just kind of let that note ring uh, and just kind of sustain itself over, uh, you know, a few pages. And it's this eerily effective uh, you know, little uh, spike of horror uh, in this in this uh, this story. That um, and I was just and, and it's okay. So is I was what 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 amazed me about that was the restraint. And I was just you know it just as a person who also writes, just thinking about the craft of it. I was like, I would never have thought to treat it that way, and it's so effective. And there's another one, another scene in which uh, there is a deal happening. Uh, someone is held at gunpoint uh, and it has all the, it has all the, um, it's like a set piece. It's like a cinematic set piece. The tension is slowly being cranked and you can just see all the characters aligning themselves here and there. One the person's going this way. And when one encounters this, one expects a particular kind of resolution. That resolution doesn't happen. And instead the narrative weight is on this very human, um, Cynical, uh, the characters are cynical, not the scene. The scene is heartbreaking. Uh, exchange between uh, the two friends and an old woman who is selling her painkillers. And, um, and, and I just found, I was struck by the choice of where you put the narrative weight in, in both of those scenes. And um, so I, I guess I'm asking you a kind of impossible question to answer, uh, which is just, I, I which is to ask you if you could talk about how you put, how you decided to weigh those kinds of scenes or just these sorts of scenes in general, like where you focus the attention. I mean, one of the refrains that I'm always telling myself, <laughs> reminding myself is, um, you know, when possible, subvert expectations try to make it fresh. I don't want, you know, at all times I felt very conscious of um, including, I felt like the reader was a part of the story from the very beginning. I know there are plenty of writers who are like, I don't think about the reader until later on. I'm not crapping on those writers because those are brilliant writers far 
more incredible careers than I will ever have. But for me, I thought about the reader from the very beginning and, and it felt like we were in on this together. Like we were all in the car together. We were in with the old woman together. And I didn't want my readers to be like, this is boring, I've seen this before, or can you be a little funnier or whatever? I mean, at all times I felt like, you know, I don't know, maybe it's that neediness again that Irene has her blues. Maybe that was the reader is my friend at that point. I'm like, here, I'm gonna do a song and dance. Um, I don't know. I, I know for the roofie scene, um, it, the weight is different um, because it felt very organic. Like at what that was not a hard decision to make. It felt very organic to have the narrator not be able to engage with what happened. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, and maybe this is part of that write what you know thing. I think that certainly, <laughs> certainly, I have not, <laughs> not engaged with painful events in the moment. And in fact, writing this book was my way of engaging with painful events, sometimes years after they happened. Um, and sometimes spookily before they happened. And maybe we can, we can talk um, circuitously about that later on. <laughs> um, so that felt as far as the, you know, the deal scene with the, the old woman, um, I don't know, to me that felt like that, it felt like, I don't know, Myrtle Beach stand up or something <laughs> like me being silly and then trying to like, okay, how else is this actually not that, I don't know, how is it different? How is, I don't know what I did, honestly, that was a hard scene to write and I'm glad it worked for you. Um, <laughs> it felt like this like puppet show, but also it's one, it, it's the one scene in the book or not the one scene, it is one, it is one of a few scenes where there's literal truth from my life in it, like almost word for word. Um, mm -hmm. So with this kind of cartoon, you know, stand up routine, there's also like this, you know, knife in the belly. Right. So I think maybe like you say that spike of horror, maybe that's the knife in the belly. And then, you know, ha ha ha, <laughs> you know, if you're stabbed in the belly, it, you know, we expect someone to scream out in pain and fall to their knees. But if they start telling a joke around it, then maybe we see, we understand it in a fresh way. I mean, gallows humor is real. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I answered that, but that's what, that's what I could. It was, it was like, it, it, it was, it was, like I said, it was a question that it didn't really have a, a, a possible answer to it. So I think, I think that you did. <laughs> um, so I, I, uh, do you, do you think of yourself as a Southern writer? Is a, do you, do you, for future work, do you, do you find yourself compelled to, to set things here? And does it matter to you that stories are set in the South? That your stories are set in the South? I mean, I wrote, <laughs> For me, I, one of my things is it's hard to write and I have to like almost trick myself into opening the document day after day. And, and I was able to, you know, seduce is the word I use a lot. I'll seduce, I was able to seduce myself into opening this manuscript day after day by setting it in a place that I miss deeply. I was living in Florida at the time. I was extraordinarily lonely. Um, I myself was adrift by setting it in rural North Carolina, which, you know, this is based on where my father grew up. It was the realm of my childhood. I could visit it every day and feel, okay, I'm writing this crazy book, but I'm surrounded by terrain that I know and love. So this is, you know, by virtue of it being in the South, it's a Southern book. And yet I don't necessarily consider myself a Southern writer. Um, my next book moves all over the United States. Um, Right now I'm writing a scene that's set in Philadelphia. So I don't know, I think, you know, maybe because of COVID I wanted to travel. <laughs> so my characters are traveling in this next, in this next one, taking trips and getting on the move and getting in trouble in uh, many different bedrooms. So yeah, my COVID novel <laughs> that is not set in COVID but is actually got that virus running through it is uh, what's, what's happening now. Yeah, I'll bet, I'll, bet, I'll bet that's the case for a lot of folks right now. Do you have a set routine, a daily routine uh, when it comes to writing? Are um, you daily a writer or are you uh, 
I used to be a daily writer. I, I, I miss being a daily writer. I'm no longer able to be a daily writer because I am a daily teacher. <laughs> um, now I have a job where I, um, that I love. It's the first job in my entire life that I've ever loved. And I told my mom that I had a job that I loved. And she's like, all my life, I never had a job that I loved. So I'm so grateful for this job that I love. But it also means that I don't have time to write every day. I try. We all do the best we can. Yeah. Um, again, you know, down with capitalism. Give us some money and let us be artists. You know, whatever. We'll figure it out. We'll do the best we can on this little planet. Do you, is there anything you want to say about the next book or is that something, are you not comfortable talking about works in progress? I mean, the only reason I'm not super comfortable talking about it is because I haven't done nearly as much work as I, <laughs> as I wish I had. I mean, for me, the pandemic, you know, brought things to a grinding halt. And then and there was also, you know, a lot of personal crises happening in the past year. Now my eyes ticking, see our bodies know things <laughs> and respond. Um, so it's, you know, I do believe, you know, I'm not a prolific writer who knows how much time is left <laughs> for any of us. So for me, I want to write books that, I don't know, can maybe move the needle to use the needle in a, in a healthy way. So one of my big passions is um, sex worker rights and burning down that stigma. So my next book is about, you know, features a full service sex worker. Um, and I am learning a lot and I'm excited to see what turns up. That raises an interesting question, uh, or what you say is interesting and the, the question might not be, but <laughs> the, um, you want to move the needle. So, do you feel a uh, do you feel a like a a responsibility uh, as a writer uh, to choose projects or to write projects that are that will move a needle uh, any uh, and on some particular gauge somewhere? I don't think I feel the responsibility, but I do recognize that, however, you know, the cards landed for me, I get to write. Mm -hmm. um, so I choose to write things that might, you know, I'm under no illusion that the wilderness is going to change public policy on the opioid crisis. At the same time, I have childish hopes that maybe it can, you know, file off the edges of some, you know, stigma. I'm under no illusion that, you know, sex workers are going to be you guys are fucking as brilliant amazing and creative which is absolutely true <laughs> you know if we actually listen to sex workers we would all learn so much we would lose our minds um in the best possible way I'm, I, I don't think that any you know novel has that power but i still you know we can try <laughs> and we'll swing swing for the fence and maybe we'll like get a little way I don't know. For me, I do. I want to make that choice. I'm lucky enough to be able to make that choice. So I want to make that choice. I do think that people who choose not to do that. Um, I don't know. I think it's a question of power. Who has the power? And do you want to, it, do, are you someone who is in power and happy of it and you want to retain it? Or are you wanting to, I don't know, help distribute the power in an equitable fashion i don't know i'm still figuring it out mm -hmm. but it, it's a choice that i'm making personally that's right for me and i you know i feel good about it good yeah i think i think i agree that novels are not likely to change policy but i do think they can change people and i think that they can change how people think about other people i think uh that is one of the most important roles literature can play and i think I think Bewilderness can do that. And I think that it will. I think uh, for those who pick it up and read it, I think it's it's just beautiful ray of humanity. It kind of just illuminates these characters and it doesn't, it doesn't apologize for them. It doesn't condescend to the reader. Uh, it, and it, it doesn't judge them, which is so important to me uh, as a reader. And uh, I think, I think uh, it's, 
it's about time for to to open this up to questions. So, but I just wanted to end by saying I think it's extraordinary, and I think it will do good work in the world. Uh, you. I think you've written something very remarkable. You're an incredible friend. I appreciate you. Hi, I, I apologize. I actually popped up um, a little earlier than I wanted to. Um, I'll just share with y'all because I got kicked out of Zoom. Um, I mentioned the <laughs> potential for, for stuff to happen and it happened. And, um, and I'm so glad that everybody else was still on. Uh, I was able to get back on and listen to y'all and then try to reconnect. So apologies for the awkward timing there. Um, but it's, uh, it's been a great conversation. Um, the, uh, the, the parts that I was able to hear <laughs> um, this far into the pandemic, um, we feel like we've, we've seen and done and experienced a lot. Um, but there's, but we've, I've just had a, a new one, slightly different permutation on the theme. So, you know, that was pretty exciting, actually. Um, we do have some questions, um, and I hope that I didn't interrupt your, your conversation if you need to um, finish any, any thoughts, but we do have a couple of audience questions if y'all are ready. Nelson is here. Um, Nelson is someone that I have known since I was a very wee person. Um, I'm so delighted that you're here. Um, thank you for coming, Nelson. This, this, now I'm going to cry as soon as this thing's over. This Aww. means a lot to me. Um, we love that. <laughs> um, do I prefer writing over acting? I mean, you know, it's hard to say. There's, there's, there, I don't know if you can beat um, inhabiting a character in your body on stage. As you know, um, Nelson's a performer too, incredible musician. Um, there, there are a few things that can beat that feeling. And even now, I, I, I think I've said this before, um, I feel most like myself when I am, you know, on stage reading from the novel or performing a character. That said, I love writing because um, we, we, you know, you get to tell, you get to tell the story, you get to, you know, choose the narrative and, and it's freaking hard. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of reward in doing something that's really difficult. Um, so given the choice, ugh, ugh, <laughs> writing so hard that it would be really hard to turn down an easier job. But I do think that sometimes we have to be called to the more challenging job and the more challenging job. Um, and probably the job with maybe more potential to do, make some change um, might be writing. I don't know, it's hard to say. That was like the hardest question ever. Thank you, Nelson. <laughs> um, Nathan, I'd like to, um... I'm not aware that you've done acting, so it's not the same question, but it does, it, it does inspire me to ask you a similar question that's come up before that I think is an interesting one, which is knowing that you have done a lot of things, um, is, is there something else that you can see yourself doing that's not writing, um, but that, you know, that might be, um, that might, be able to fill that that sort of same space that writing does for you. What what else do you see yourself being? I think I would always be a creative person. I think if like I got to the point where I didn't have the stamina to write a novel, which is an incredible athletic feat. It's like really rowing across <laughs> the ocean in a tiny little canoe is how it feels like, or you know, beating through this forest and all you have this little one little snake stick. Um, if I, if I didn't have that, I would probably, you know, write flash. I would write something shorter. I would, you know, go back to school and get a degree in poetry and try to learn how to write poems. If I couldn't write, I would, you know, teach myself to paint, um, go to school for that. I don't know. It would be something. It would be something. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it would, I think that's the only way for, you know, to live a life that for me, that isn't, doesn't drive me to numbing myself with, with unhealthy substances. Nathan, what about you? More, more creativity for you as well, or do you see something else? Um, when I was younger, I was, uh, I, uh, 
I played trumpet a lot and I got to be pretty good at it until I stopped in college. Um, but I don't know. I think I, 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 this is the only, only creative means that I have uh, at which I'm even, you know, remotely any, you know, competent at. Uh, I don't think anything else would, would really fit that bill. And as far as like, so what else would I do? Uh, it probably wouldn't be something, you know, in the creative field. It would probably be something you know, I enjoyed tending bar when I was a bartender. That was the best, uh, best job that isn't this you know, that I ever had, uh, you know, uh, and it gave you this wonderful, even much more so than waiting tables. Cause as Karen and I were saying earlier that, you know, the dynamic has kind of narrowed down to, uh, this, you know, this kind of like monetary exchange in a very specific way. Bartending, you know, they all come to you and they are hanging out, they're having friends. It's a much more friendly relationship and you get a really interesting cross section. If you're in a decent neighborhood bar of a wide variety of people and, uh, and their derangements. Uh, so that was, uh, I could, I could see myself being happy doing that again. Thank you for that. Um, and we have, we have another question. Kathy is asking what insights do addicts have to share with us? I would say that I've heard people who, people who have substance use disorder, um, I can, uh, maybe the right word is metaphor or, or comparison. I've heard it said that it, it's often useful to look at it as some, something similar to someone who has a learning disorder. So it's, and, and so I would say that how you, you know, how do you navigate the world with a brain that, that um, isn't the operating the way that probably many brains operate. How do you, how do you work? What is your workaround? What is your solution? What do you, what do you do when your brain gets in your way and says, do this, even though, you know, it's potentially deeply unhealthy. And now in 2021, potentially fatal with all of the fentanyl on the market um, and so many counterfeit products. Um, someone I'm very close to almost died in January because of half of a pill that was fake. Um, so what insights, um, I guess the same insights that anyone would have who has had to navigate um, hardship, trauma, disability. Um, I think we, we learn and grow from that and, and I would not want to speak for any individual. I, you know, um, I would say that the person I know who almost died in January, that insight, and they're not here tonight to share it, but I feel pretty comfortable saying that they, um, their insight would be live every freaking day fully and follow your passion. You don't know what's coming. You never know when it could get snatched away. Um, make healthy choices and take care of people you love. I think they would sign off on that. <laughs> Thank you for that question. And Matt Mueller's here. It was a, another good so friend. You know. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Um, that makes me so happy. How do you balance teaching and writing? And how does one influence the other? If you had to choose, is teaching a restaurant work better fodder for writing? Um, um, balancing teaching and writing is, is an incredible challenge. Uh, I would rather ask everybody else that question because that's one answer I absolutely don't have especially when you have wonderful students I, I'm lucky I teach at a place where I have really great students right now um I guess I've always had great students what am I talking about um I've always had great students the students the university students right now are the are an incredible generation everybody don't worry about them and yet they need resources so let's help all of our young people <laughs> thrive um, because it's really hard to be a young person right now. Um, balancing it, I don't know. I think balancing is absolutely out of the conversation. And I think it's like you, you know, triage at this point. <laughs> what do you have to do in the next hour? Oh, I teach in an hour. Well, guess what? I'm teaching. Okay, uh, I don't have to, <laughs> I have a deadline in two hours. That's what's happening next. Um, it's kind of scrambling. If you had to choose teaching or restaurant work, ugh whatever helps you write. I know there are plenty of servers and bartenders out in the world who feel 
who, who, who come home exhausted and broke and, and aren't able to think about writing after the evening they've gone through. You know, Nathan and I were lucky. We had pretty fortunate circumstances in where we worked, at least at this, you know, where we, our, our last jobs. Um, so many people don't have that. So you can get a cushy job at a restaurant, do it. They're hard to come by. Um, you can get a cushy job as a teacher, do it. They're hard to come by. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think the best tip for any writer is be born into a wealthy family. I really do. Um, the rest of us, yeah, good luck. <laughs> we're, we're all trying our best. Yeah. That seems like a good tip for anybody. What's the phrase? It's good work if you can get it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so we're we're coming up on eight o'clock, and I know that Patricia has been posting your um, reading recommendations in the chat. Oh. Um, and uh, I I want to actually give you both the opportunity to do some of what we call in the book business hand selling. Um, if you'd each like to pick a couple of titles that that you would like to to leave our audience or our our viewers whenever they're watching with. Um, books that you think they should pick up. And before we do that, I just want to remind folks um, to uh, purchase Bewilderness um, and purchase from Malaprops if you can, if you're here with us, if you know, we're your, your home store, we appreciate your support. It helps us do what we do. If you're not here and you have your own local indie that you support, please support them. Um, just shop indies first. That's, that's, Yes. Or we ask and yes. we feel like it's pretty important and that we're all in this together. Um, and also, please, if you haven't read Nathan's books yet, please do that. Um, uh, he will, I'll just go ahead and say it, scare the crap out of you. Um, don't let the mild manneredness deceive you when it comes to how dark the writing can get, but it's really good. <laughs> so, um, uh, highly recommend. And we've got signed copies at, at, uh, at Malaprops as well. Um, so I just want to encourage everyone to support, uh, to support these authors and, and independent booksellers. Um, with that, yes, um, reading recommendations. I'll start with you, Karen. So the first one I'm, I'm picking, it's called Marriage of a Thousand Lies. And this is from um, S.J. Sindhu. Um, Sindhu won a bunch of awards for this. Um, I love this novel. It's um, about a Sri Lankan immigrant um, woman who comes here and has to have this... Um, she's she's queer, but she's married to another queer man so that they can then have their own secret lives on the side, but then they, you know, of course she meets someone that, mm, is my marriage right for me? Um, it just, it's just really, it's really wonderful and, and, and thoughtful and smart and funny. The other one um, is a story collection called The Rock Eaters by Brenda Peinado. Um, short stories, there's some magical stuff in here. I haven't read all these stories yet. This book just came out last week or two weeks ago. Um, so smart and, and just wise and wicked and, yeah, I would, those are the two that I would, I brought a whole stack here, but we're short on time. So those are my two. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Nathan, what about you? I'll be quick too. I just have uh, three titles uh, I wanted to, uh, to uh, mention. Uh, one is a novel called The Fisherman by John Langan. Uh, I, uh, all of these are kind of like uh, kind of dark, fant dark fantasy sorts of, uh, or, or in the case of Langan's novel, a horror novel. But very, uh, uh, you know, kind of he writes in sort of a Jamesian tradition, very you know, layer, layered narratives, nested narratives, um, and uh, it's uh, a, a beautiful novel. Uh, and two short story collections. One is uh, uh, "Furnace" by Livia Llewellyn uh, from Lethe Press. Uh, very dark, uh, uh, it's dark enough that uh, you know you should like, be aware that you're going to be in for a a ride uh, going in. And uh, the other one is by a writer named Priya Sharma, uh, a collection called All the Fabulous Beasts, uh, which are uh, just beautiful fantasy stories. Uh, all three of those I recommend very highly. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you both for adding to our to be read piles. Um, we always like to leave audiences with that. Um, and, and thank you for the conversation this evening. Karen, congratulations on your novel. Um, and I, I just want to say how much I appreciate both of you spending time with us and, and Karen in particular um, for just the really authentic way that you've you know, shared your work and, um, and your insights this evening. Um, thank you. I think, I think that um, it's been a really edifying uh, event on, on multiple levels for that reason. I'm really Thank grateful you. for this, for you hosting this event and for inviting me to do this. I um, appreciate you so much. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, and Nathan, thank you um, for joining us from down the street, um, spending some time with your friend. Um, we oh, appreciate yeah. I mean, it's always fun to do something with Malaprops and it's a special treat to do something uh, for Karen's book. So, yeah. Wonderful. Very Thank happy. you. Thank you both again so much. Um, everyone out there, thanks for joining us, spending some time with us. Uh, please uh, stay safe, stay well, take care of yourselves, read some good books. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Um, thanks so much, everybody. Good night.